All right. Welcome everyone to the September 14th, 2020 uh, meeting of the RTD Accountability Committee. I think this is meeting number three. And again, uh, co-chair Crystal and Elise, co-chairs are going to split the meeting, so I'll start off. And um, Crystal and I didn't talk about it, but somewhere probably between four and five, we'll switch off if that works. Um, does staff want to call the roll just so um, we... The, the recording and everybody uh, knows who all's on. Sure, I, I can do that, Elise. Awesome. Uh, let me see here. Dea, I see Dea's here. And, Dea's here. And uh, well, Rebecca White now is replacing Sophie, Sophie Schulman. Good morning. Uh, is Chris, is Chris Fapton, Frampton in yet? Not yet. Rut, Rut Bridges, C. Rut. I'm here. Elise Jones. Present. Crystal Moreo. Present. How'd I do, Crystal? Uh, you know. No, I know. <laughs> Doug, just stop. I know. Just stop. Um, <laughs> that's right, Chris. For all of our here. sakes. <laughs> Jackie Malay is there. I'm here. Jula Duran Mullica, also Here. present. Kathy Nesbitt. Good morning, Kathy. Dan Blankenship. Dan. And Kristen Trustman. Morning. Kristen. Oh, there she is. Good morning. And Doug, Chris yeah, Frampton. Did, Madam Chair. Chris, oh, Chris Frampton did join, so I brought him over, so he should be there. Okay, great. Hi. All right. So is that everybody? That is. All right, we have a full house. Thanks everybody for taking time to be here. So next we'll move to public comment. This is the first um, official public comment period we've had and we'll allocate up to 20 minutes. Um, and each speaker will be limited to two minutes. Um, and, and we ask that any speaker focus on items on our current agenda. Do we have any members of the public on the line? I think that was I'm gonna I, I I need to unmute everyone. I apologize. Give me one second. You've got third string trying to manage this meeting. There we go. If you want to ask for a public comment now, anyone anyone on the line should be able to unmute themselves if they have public comment to make to the committee. Okay, so I'll reopen public comment and uh, anybody like to speak to us will have up to two minutes to speak to us on any item on our agenda, which includes um, the on-call on consultant, the equity and sustainability working group recommendations, or the three um, subcommittees. Do we have anybody who would like to speak to us? Co-Chair Jones, I'm not hearing anyone and I'm not seeing anyone raise their hand to be recognized at this time. Wow. All right. Well, um, obviously word hasn't gotten out about this exciting opportunity to speak to us, but I'm sure future meetings, we will have more people. All right. With that, let's move on to the... Um, Sorry, I inadvertently muted you. You should be able to unmute yourself now. Uh. There you go, Co-Chair Jones. All right, technical difficulties. I'm so sorry. No, it's all right. Um, it's Monday morning. You know, we're just lucky we're all here. All right, so um, moving on to the meeting summary from the August 24th meeting. Um, did anybody have any um, edits needed? Or do we need a motion to accept it? We do not, Madam Chair. Okay. Rut, did you have any? I saw you raise your hand. Can you hear me? Now I can. 
It says Elise Jones commented that there should be a discussion on other additions to the guidelines, including the opportunity for a minority report to reflect descending views. I think you mean dissenting views dissenting. on any document the committee produces. So okay, I'll right. it matters. <laughs> we'll make that change. Equalize. It's going. All okay. right, so we would ask staff to make that change. Any other uh, needed edits? Okay, so the meeting summary stands. Oh. And we'll... Just a, a, a quick question to Rut. Uh, uh, you had sent me an email about um, reflecting uh, your um, your position on the committee, on, on the minutes and everything else. Were, were you satisfied with that? uh yeah yeah sure okay good just want to make sure no problem all right then shall we move on to action item which are, uh item number four is the on call call consultant selection i think matthew your task with that update good morning committee um at the first meeting in August, uh, August 10th, uh, you recognized the need for on-call on consulting to support your work, and Dr. Cog and uh, the committee solicited proposals for on-call consulting uh, for guidance, research, document development, facilitation, and any other related tasks as they arise. Uh, there were uh, four proposals, um, one from Economic and Planning Systems, Inc., one from government uh, government performance solutions one from hdr and then one from uh, north highland consulting uh, a, a review panel made up of uh, uh, committee members as well as dr cog staff evaluated the proposals and uh, while it was clear that that all firms were were capable of doing this work the panel came to a consensus on on selecting north highland due to its qualifications and varied experience, uh, including relevant public sector work on equity and, and human resource issues in addition to transit. And uh, one of the highlights of their transit experience is a very similar task for New Jersey Transit, which is New Jersey's Public Transportation Corporation. Uh, this item is scheduled for action by Dr. Cog's Finance and Budget or F&B Committee uh, tomorrow evening. Uh, in the event that the committee does not concur uh, with the panel's recommendation, uh, Dr. Cog's staff will advise uh, F&B accordingly. But um, uh, this morning we are looking uh, for uh, concurrence with the review panel on the recommendation to contract with North Highland for on-call consulting to support the RTD Accountability Committee. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Matthew. Any questions or um, further comments from the uh, selection committee members? I'm not seeing any. So I would uh, entertain a motion then to um, uh, signal uh, our concurrence with the recommendation um, to the Dr. Cog Finance and Budget Committee. For that, oh, is that Jackie? No, but I'll do it. So moved, or Chris, was that? Second. I seconded or motion it. I don't care. Doesn't matter either. <laughs> okay, so the motion. There's been a motion and a second. All in favor, please indicate aye. 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 Opposed. Abstentions. All right. It's a unanimous recommendation for North Highland. And then. Um, we are just flying through our agenda, but let me let me turn it over to my co-chair to take it from here for the second action item. Uh, thank you, Elise. Um, alrighty, uh, so we had a subcommittee, um, well, I guess it's not a subcommittee, we had a working group, rather, um, talk about and discuss um, our working group recommendations for equity and sustainability. Um, and do we need to approve that? Or are we just, is this like a, just for the committee to adopt at this point? 
uh, where are we at in this process? Um, Co-Chair Murillo, we are looking for approval by the by the full committee of the equity assessment um, as the guiding document for the accountability committee. Has everyone had a chance to review the uh, attachment, uh, attachment C, that has our mission statement um, and operationalizing equity in our subcommittee structure? And are there any questions? I, I do have a, a question. The, the charge the committee was equity, equity and sustainability. And I didn't see much in there about sustainability. And I think one of the big reasons why this committee was set up was to look at the economic sustainability issue, long-term economic sustainability. And I, I just didn't see anything about that in this. And is this a, a mission statement for our committee, our whole committee, or is it about the issue of sustainability? A very important issue, but uh, but also equity is a huge issue, and, and I'm not in any way uh, trying to minimalize that. But um, it won't matter if we don't have an RTD that's sustainable. Indeed. Um, Coach Remedio, if I, if I could. Um, yes. Uh, Committee Member Bridges, Ron Papsdorf here. So the, the work group met on the 31st of August and the intent here with this equity statement, this mission statement is to guide the work of the subcommittees and the full committee. Um, it was intended to address social, economic and environmental equity as paramount issues for the work of the subcommittees and the committee. Um, so that was that was sort of the discussion of the of the working group uh, that put this together to try to capture all of those elements um, of, of equity, uh, both so, social, economic, and environmental equity across the region. So, and the and the committee had quite a or the working group had a significant conversation about sort of how to actually operationalize um, that through the application of an equity lens through a series of questions that would be considered by um, all of the work of the subcommittees and ultimately the full uh, full committee um, in terms of forming, con forming and considering issues, policy proposals, um, all of those elements um, through the application of those questions that are laid out in the, um, in the attachment to the agenda item, uh, if, if that helps. If you have further questions about that, Maybe other folk, other members of the working group um, might want to um, summarize their their conversation. Doug, I think you did a good job um, of summarizing the conversation. Um, Rhett, to your point, there isn't anything that explicitly says sustainability, um, but I, I mean, I think that's certainly. I mean, when I think of triple bottom line. Um, and all of these issues, I mean, you kind of are thinking of long term versus short term and we kind of, um, I think the conversation kind of alluded to the fact that like through our process, we'll be talking about kind of short term and long term um, goals, recommendations, that kind of a thing. Um, so I don't know if any other committee or working group members wanted to comment on the sustainability piece, um, but I think it's um, well, I, I'll just hold off. Um, does anyone have any other comments from the committee? I think, um, uh, Crystal, I, I would just add that um, this is not meant to be, um, this is, in my mind, this is the mission statement regarding the social, economic, and environmental equity lens. It's not the mission statement for the entire uh body of work that the, that the accountability committee is going to be considering but recognizing the importance of these issues um that that was my intent with with this and and i actually do think the environmental sustainability as i'm reading it again it probably does need to be strengthened in the document because it really doesn't um and uh it does seem much more about um, social equity than it does this environmental sustainability. So I, I think that's a really good catch. But Jackie, I think Rudd is talking about financial sustainability. In uh, particular, and that to me- I, too. I mean, but, I also noticed that. I had a note about the issue that 
you know, one of the biggest problems that we have is is our compliance with the, with air quality. Yeah. Below front range. And right. I, I think that. Yeah. And uh, Chris, I think that was you. Uh, my yeah. comment was more about uh, what this piece of it was. I expect that the financial sustainability issue will be addressed in the financial uh, working group. Right. So this isn't the be all end all of it. This was just in my mind dealing with the um, uh, and I know it says economic equity, but I'm thinking it more about the impacts on these populations, the economic impacts on these populations, not the economic sustainability of the organization. And that was just my viewpoint. So curious what the other, uh, that's how I divided it up. So curious what other committee members. Yeah. Yeah. So this is Daya, I'll just jump in. I mean, I think the issue itself is very intersectional. And so it could show up within one of these questions that the issue of sustainability, let me be clear, could show up within one of the questions as we analyze this ourselves. Um, the financial and financial sustainability, I don't necessarily see that as reflected as um, I think it could be. But when I think of, for example, air quality, for example, that could show up within any number of these questions, within any of these four questions, um, depending on how we decide to uh, analyze it. I think one thing that I do want to just share is that the working group did have this pretty robust conversation around how do we operationalize it. And I think this is what we're lifting up is that as we think about operationalizing it, it might be helpful for us to, to really be clear about how we want environmental sustainability, um, financial sustainability to show up within these questions. Um, so I just want to lift that up Rut, that that is something that we we really did yeah. struggle with quite a bit. Sure, and certainly that the issue of environmental quality is also one that is very relevant uh, across low income people and things like that, which often bear the brunt of lack of that. The, yeah. There was one other thing I wanted to ask about, and and that is, is it the intent of this mission statement that each subcommittee consider assessment of any input obtained through public engagement before making final subcommittee recommendations. Is that essentially saying that each one of the subcommittees has to hold public hearings on all of their recommendations at the subcommittee level before we get to the main committee level? Um, I'm just going to make a comment and then I see that Elise has been trying to speak so I wanted to give her the floor but um, no my, the, the intent of this document is to be very um, high level mission statement um, the question of operationalizing there's some guidance here um, but it doesn't direct any specific um, committee to hold specific uh, public hearings for any particular items um, at least it's not my uh, understanding of the document. Um, Elise, did you want to comment? Um, I, I was just trying to um, see if there was agreement around Jackie's point about the mission statement. It's a mission statement, not for the not for the committee's work, but for the equity lens on which the committee um, will conduct its work. And I just wanted to make sure that there there was clarity around that piece of it, so that it, we're we're talking about the triple bottom line of equity as part of that lens. And is there is there any disagreement on that point? I just wanted to to because the mission statement just says mission statement and left to its own device. You could think that's the mission statement of this committee. And that's uh, I think not quite right. Oh, so you're saying equity mission, or, you know, equity mission statement to to add further clarity to what the mission yeah, statement so is about. So it's the mission statement for the equity lens that we'll be applying to the work of the committee. Um, but yeah. to what's earlier point, the the mission of the committee writ large is sort of the future sustainability of RTD, right. and in that work, we're going to be applying an equity lens. But but the purpose of the committee still is about the sustain the you know the future of RTD as the or, organization. It's a it's a fine point, but I think it's worth clarifying. So Indeed. we might just change the the title to make it clear for anybody coming 
reading this document and then as we refer back to it. Okay, then point taken. Um, does anyone disagree with um, changing the title just so that it's clear that this is the equity lens that we'll be applying in our work? Um, is everyone okay with that? A lot of head nods. I'm not sure we need an official uh, vote or anything, uh, but Doug, it looks like um, we're all in agreement um, that this just needs to be further clarified with uh, the mission statement. Um, otherwise, it, I mean, unless there are any other additional edits, is the committee okay with adopting this as the equity lens mission statement? Um, I imagine there were there were some tools that were shared. I think it was Kathy that had shared kind of a checklist um, type tool that we might be able to apply um, as we start building those recommendations down the road, just so that we're um, again operationalizing and supporting the committee um, further. Okay, so the only thing I would <clears throat> excuse me suggest is I do think. Um, the environmental piece is a, a little bit lacking here. I think we could, and I'm just wondering if staff could, I don't have the edit that I would recommend right now, but right. if we could strengthen that um, language uh, to, to make it clear, it, it does look most, a quick review of this would, would it, the mission statement addresses it, but when, the, when we talk about operationalizing it, um, I think we could add some words that, we make it clear it's environmental as well as um, social. <laughs> Would those words go best in the intro section or in the questions? Because if well, you define in, equity broadly, in the in the, in the intro section, uh, yeah, like maybe was, a sentence or two on yes. financial equi environmental equity and and you could even financial equity there because it's not really called out either, but right. certainly the environmental not in the piece. questions, but in the intro paragraph, yep. Okay. Um, is that something that Dr. Cogstaff can do? Okay, great. Yes, it is. Um, yes. So with those Hi. edits, I'm do sorry, we need sorry, to- I have one quick question. Oh yes, go ahead, um, Kathy. You mentioned the documents that I sent. Ron, did you have a chance to take a look at them? What did you um, think? Yes, we have Kathy and that they, I think are very useful tools. I know Matthew looked at them as well. Um, so we're happy to share those out. We, we felt like those were sort of background pieces that we would su supply to the subcommittees and the committee because they're, they're supplemental to this to help with this. We didn't consider them sort of part of the adoption by the committee. Um, so very useful tools though, to help um, the subcommittees and the committee work through this, this process. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I guess the only comment on that, just to not derail the conversation too much, is um, <clears throat> we'll probably have to talk about whether or not we just want a checklist or we want some sort of justification since this all has to go. This is all very public, public hearings, et cetera. Um, so again, with uh, Dr. Cog, his staff is going to make some edits to make it a little more substantive on some of the other parts of equity. Um, do we need to bring this back up? Can we um, communicate via email and, and approve those changes in that way? Electronic voting. Electronic voting? Yes. I think so. They're pretty okay. minor, should be minor adjustments and shouldn't be hard to reach resolution. Yes, indeed. Okay, so then we will um, expect an email from uh, our Dr. Cog staff in order to resolve this agenda item, but it sounds like it's mostly agreement. Um, and I'm really glad that we had the opportunity to work through that. Great. Okay. Uh, Chair. Yes. If, if I may, this is Doug real quick. Um, just, just for transparency purposes, what we will do, yes, electronic voting is certainly possible in this regard. And then once we get an, an, an approval from you guys, we'll bring it back just as an information item. We don't have to take it up or anything so that we can share that with, with the general public. Perfect. All righty. Um, not seeing any other comments, and so we'll move on. Um, and then we have some informational items, speaking of that, um, on subcommittee reports. Um, I don't believe all of the subcommittees have met quite yet. Was Is that accurate? That That is accurate. Um, only the uh, two out of the three have met so far. 
the operating subcommittee and the finance committee uh, subcommittee. Um, the finance committee did select uh, a member to uh, report out, but the um, the operations subcommittee uh, didn't do that. Uh, so I am going to report out and I'm about to share my screen. So please let me know when, when you see it. Uh, this, this makes it a little bit easier. We can see it. Great. Uh, so the operations subcommittee, well, both subcommittees uh, worked on um, uh, editing and enhancing uh, their um, the, the topics that they're going to take up. And um, the operations subcommittee, as you can see under the operations subcommittee column, made some changes. Um, so uh, one of the changes was uh, to clarify, further clarify ADA com uh, compliance by adding uh, vehicles and rules uh, to uh, in addition to the facilities and services. Um, and then um, there was uh, some, uh, some movement on um, some other items uh, uh, services provided the, by the district was uh, moved from um, operations to finance and then um, added uh, workforce retention, hiring and management, uh, uh, community-based service delivery, uh, uh, which was more specific uh, to the, um, the services piece. Uh, plans and criteria for expansions or reductions in service. Uh, and then air quality was added to climate change goals and fair structures was added, but um, they wanted to, to, to clarify it further that uh, for the operations committee, it would be uh, equity and fair structures and not necessarily the financial piece, which makes more sense uh, for the finance committee. Uh, so with that, I will, <coughs> excuse me, I will turn it over to Rut, who uh, has volunteered to, um, to report out for the finance subcommittee. Yeah. Uh, so first, uh, if there are any questions, I'm, I'm happy to try to answer those, but we may, I guess we we're the last committee to report out, so hopefully there won't be. Uh, first, we welcome Rebecca White, who is CDOT's Director of the Division of Transportation Development to the committee, our larger committee, as well as to the uh, Finance Committee. And um, I want to note that the list of our Finance Committee's goals are our current working version and it's not set in stone. Our objective uh, will be to address the goals related to financial matters. It's stated in the press release that define the formation and duties of the independent RTD Accountability Committee. And this summary is likely to evolve as we develop a deeper understanding of the challenges facing RTD in these tumultuous times. So here are the current goals. Uh, first, the use of the CARES Act and other pandemic-related funds in support of RTD's mission. Uh, to review the current state audits, including with respect to staff management, retention, and hiring. Uh, the issue of bus lines subsidizing fast tracks rail lines. Uh, how much of the six-tenths of a cent sales and use tax has been diverted uh, to fast tracks? Regional equity and the finances of finishing fast tracks or providing equivalent mobility to unfinished corridors. Are fast tracks monies and base funds generally being spent equitably relative to the counties where they are generated? And we need to get accurate data from RTD regarding the expenditures to date. So can and should uh, the, the RTD Accountability Committee make recommendations, so for example, the legislature, the governor, on the broader transportation pricing context. And then reviewing and recommending potential changes to RTD status, statutes, such as the provision that requires RTD to raise a certain amount through fares, 
Uh, note that this is a barrier to low cost or fare free services. The provision not allowing RTD to develop anything but parking lots on its property, for example, transit oriented development on RTD owned property could be a good source of revenue for RTD. The provision preventing RTD from charging for parking to in district patrons for the first 24 hours. Uh, the provision requiring RTD to contract out a certain percentage of its bus operations. Uh, and uh, finally, are, are there other state and federal funding sources that can contribute to help provide transportation services to low income populations? For example, low cost or no cost fares for low income users, rather than RTD shouldering all the cost of that. So. That's where we pretty much where we are right now in terms of what we see as some of the goals and things that we need to we need to work on. Thanks. That about Thank you, Bryce. And so the um, governance subcommittee will be meeting this week. Um, is it Wednesday? That's correct. Yep. Okay, so we'll be getting an update from them at the at the next meeting. But um, I just wanted to say, you know, um, I was able to participate in the operations subcommittee conversation, and um, one thing that I thought was important to note was that though we have kind of buckets of work just to kind of uh, make this an efficient process, we recognize that the there's going to be a lot of overlap in some of the. Uh, items that will have to go through multiple committees um, if we really want a robust kind of overview. And so um, we recognize that and we'll have to figure out a, a way to track the flow of that work between subcommittees. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll gain some clarity as we start digging into actual items. This is all of these conversations as far have been very high level overview. Um, and so we'll have to find a way to be able to um, make sure we give each committee enough time to address some of those issues um, by the date that we have to um, submit our report. So we recognize that, I, you know, Dr. Cog's staff is aware of that um, and will support us in being able to accomplish that. Are there any comments from the committee on the subcommittee reports? This is Daya. I just want to jump in and say I um, am excited to hear that the finance subcommittee is certainly exploring um, the various provisions that I know several transit advocates have looked at for quite some time. Um, so while I'm not on that committee, if there's any way that we can support you all, I'm happy to do so. Thank you. Not seeing any other comments. Wonderful. Great. Um, uh, all right, um, next agenda item is an RTD update, and I will let Dr. Cog's staff uh, take it away. Can't hear you muted. Okay. Sorry about that, I was muted. I'm going to provide a high level update, and uh, then we have Bruce Abel from RTD staff to provide some additional detail. One sec, here we go. Uh, so RTD has a projected, as many of you know, $166 million uh, budget shortfall for 2021. Um, they were appropriated uh, a, a little over $230 million in CARES Act funding in May, which has kept the organization afloat during the economic fallout from COVID-19. However, even with the influx of federal funds, the, the 2020 RTD budget is expected to see a roughly uh, $17 million deficit by the end of the year. Uh, this has led to RTD uh, currently providing about 60% of the number of hours, uh, service hours than before the pandemic, with about 40% of the ridership versus before the pandemic, generating a need for additional operating and maintenance dollars beyond current revenue. Uh, during a study session 
back on September 2nd, members of RTD's board of directors examine ways that they can continue to operate under the circumstances without additional cuts. Uh, in addition to other potential strategies, this led to initial discussions about the Fast Track's internal savings account, the FISA, an account set up to accumulate uh, proceeds from specific RTD uh, approved cost saving and revenue enhancing measure measures uh, to pay for finishing all of uh, the remaining fast tracks components. So we have um, we have Bruce Abel here uh, to provide uh, ad additional detail on this topic. Uh, uh, he is uh, his committee his internal committee is going to be presenting. Uh, some uh, recommendations to the RTD board tomorrow evening at their study session. With and that, so, turn it over to Bruce. So, Matthew, can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, great. Well, thanks. Um, thanks for the opportunity to have a conversation about some of our challenges. Uh, what I'd like to do is present a short briefing, maybe six minutes or so, and then be glad to answer some questions. Uh, as Matthew has uh, set some of the context for it already. But really our challenge in a nutshell for uh, 2021 is how to address the projected $166 million shortfall that's projected for the calendar year, which is also our fiscal year. Now these numbers are, are, are obviously going to be changing as we continue to get um, actual sales tax forecasts as well as new forecasts. But this is where we're started. Sales and use tax in a normal year provides about 65% of RTD's normal operating and maintenance um, costs, O&M. So it provides about 65% of the revenue stream to cover our O&M costs. Fairbox usually provides 15 to 20% uh, of the revenue stream to cover our O&M costs. So between the two of them, we're looking at about 80 to 85% uh, of our revenue stream. Pre-COVID sales tax projections for 21, uh, as projected by the LEED School of Business, pre-pandemic projections were $711 million. Subsequent to the COVID-induced slowdown, the most recent LEED School forecast indicates that sales and use tax for next year will be about $571 million. That's a decrease of $140 million, or about 20% of the main source of our revenue. This is probably not unlike many other municipal, county, and state governments where sales tax is a major part of the, part of the revenue stream. Pre-COVID sales tax, uh, excuse me, Fairbox revenues were estimated to be about another $130 million, but subsequent to the onset of the pandemic, RTD ridership dropped about 60% to about 40% of pre-COVID levels, and that's where it remains today. So fare box revenues also have declined markedly uh, initially due to free fare service at the outset of the pandemic and now due to continued ridership reductions. Light rail and regional ridership is down markedly in the 75 to 80 percent category as both of those services are very commuter centric and there's no more peak hour commute ridership on transit as many folks continue to work from home. Local bus ridership is also down but not as dramatically it's down about 40%, 45% as essential workers that depend on transit continue to ride. Overall ridership continues to be about 40% of the pre-COVID levels. Uh, effective mid-April, RTD reduced transit service to weekend levels of service to better match the reduced demand. And we have used CARES Act funding, $232 million that Matthew referred to earlier, to keep the entire workforce employed and to fund additional COVID-related expenses, PPE, cleaning, et cetera. Uh, the CARES Act funds are anticipated to be fully depleted by the end of 2020. So to summarize today, we're carrying about 40% of pre-pandemic ridership. We're operating about 60% of pre-pandemic service levels, and we are maintaining 100% of the pre-pandemic staffing and using CARES money to do so. So in order to address the financial reality, uh, RTD has already implemented a variety of reduction strategies in 2020, and we'll have additional cost-cutting strategies in 21. We have already implemented things such as nine furlough days for all salaried employees for the remainder of 2020, 
which will generate just under $3 million for the year. We have deferred numerous capital and maintenance projects. We have suspended professional development, except for job required training. We have eliminated travel. We have done a hiring freeze, all the things that would be sort of routine cost containment strategies uh, for an organization with our kinds of challenges. So an internal COVID re fiscal response task force was created within the RTD organization to address next year. Each assistant general manager was asked to evaluate and prioritize their programs, their processes, their staffing in order to identify savings for 2021 and help us address the $166 million shortfall. Um, they were asked to identify projects, programs, or expenses that could be de delayed or eliminated, to evaluate staffing levels in light of a dramatically reduced organization, and present recommendations uh, to address the future shortfall. Uh, as part of that process, the board established several guiding principles to give staff direction on how to balance the budget, and probably uh, the most germane uh, that the board advised staff that reducing service levels should not be our primary response. Service reductions should be minimized uh, in order to minimize the impact to our customers, that we should take a balanced approach um, to cost reduction, uh, prioritize mobility for people who most depend on transit, uh, support all employees, and several others. So the board conceptually approved the following financial strategies to help us address 2021. First, they asked us to consider reductions in administrative uh, overhead costs. They advised us it would be okay to utilize reserves, but to limit their use. That it would be okay to utilize future contributions to the Fast Track's internal savings account, or the FISA, the future contributions being those that would be generated from um, that portion of the initial Fast Track's ballot language that set aside money for increasing rubber tired service over the years. That it would be okay to utilize things like when we get the credit risk premium uh, refund and to use cost savings from project savings from Siri, the end line, et cetera, to help offset projected fast tracks shortfalls. They also advise us that we should not utilize any of the existing FISA balance or the corpus that has become denoted, uh, and they don't want to serve, reduce service levels below that which we are currently offering, which is 60% of pre-pandemic levels. Uh, so the task force is uh, going to be meeting again with the board tomorrow evening in study session. Some of our recommendations for next year include no travel, no temporary employees, no professional and organizational dues, no publications and subscriptions, no future employee referral and signing bonuses except those that have already been earned and we will continue to pay out, the elimination of professional development unless it's job required. We would suspend Leadership Academy, suspend the multi-agency exchange program. Uh, those are, I would call, the routine, uh, again, the routine cost reduction strategies for an organization in, uh, in our financial circumstance. In the service-related bucket, we are targets to maintain current levels of service. Uh, we would anticipate redeploying those hours from underutilized routes to those services that have retained ridership during the pandemic, because unless there is a new CARES Act, we'll no longer be able to provide follower service, which is putting a bus in. Uh, to follow a bus that reaches uh, capacity requirements due to social uh, and physical distancing requirements on board each bus. We anticipate that accessoride demand will continue to be below pre-pandemic levels. We will continue to provide grocery delivery service to our accessoride clients as these are the most, uh, the most vulnerable of our, of our customers. We'll continue to provide reduced level of flex ride service and we will continue to evaluate the mix of services provided between internal RTD employees and contractors. Task force is also recommending um, reductions or eliminations in payroll and benefit related expenses in 2021. Obviously there would be no pay increases for salaried employees. We're recommending no increases to the contributions to the salaried pension plan, recommending temporary reductions in contributions to the salary defined contribution plan, lowering it from 9% to 7%, elimination of buyback of unused vacation, sick, and PTO time because of the cash flow implications, elimination of overtime, except where uh, appropriate because there are times when it's appropriate to build overtime into a bus 
operator schedule as opposed to create an additional shift. Recommending tiered furloughs for salaried employees, zero to 60,000, there would be no furlough days. 60,000 to 100,000, there would uh, 120,000, there would be six furlough days, 120 to 180, 12 furlough days, which is between four and a half and 5% salary reduction. And over $180,000, uh, there would be 18 furlough days, which is between a seven and seven and a half percent salary equivalent. Staffing levels adjusted to right size the organization to align staffing with continuing operating service at about 60%. We'll include elimination of some positions, consolidations of others. While we continue to work out the final details, it's likely that we will have uh, reductions of about 25 to 30% of the workforce. This includes both vacant and filled positions for both represented and salaried staff. This equates to about 550 part-time and full-time positions that are currently filled, again, both represented and salaried staff. Uh, in addition, there are a number of vacant, the budgeted positions that will generate uh, savings to the agency. And again, I want to emphasize that these figures are changing as we continue to conduct more detailed analysis. For example, these numbers have changed from numbers that people heard last week as we have put some more operators back onto the list of those to retain to provide additional flexibility as we move into 2021. So I think in closing, I would say that the most important thing we can do is remain flexible and respond to our reality as it unfolds, because all of these strategies are based on the latest forecasts. We receive actuals monthly in terms of reports on our sales tax collections. We will get another forecast from the Leeds School of Business at the end of September. June and July actuals came in stronger than anticipated. Uh, there are dueling theories in the newspaper as to whether August is going to come in stronger than anticipated or weaker because of the, the loss of the $600 a week um, payments, transfer payments. So we just have to monitor, stay vigilant, be flexible. Um, it's very difficult to forecast in the current environment because we've never experienced anything like it. We also need to see how transit ridership responds. We continue to see it at about 40% of our pre-COVID levels. Um, we'll be holding a workshop with the board tomorrow evening, the 15th, uh, Finance and Administration Committee on the 22nd, uh, and then a board meeting on the 29th to discuss the midterm financial plan. And then in October and November, we'll move into the actual November uh, to the 2021 budget process. So with that, be glad to answer any questions. Madam Chair, Elise Jones. Um, yeah, thanks so much for that report. That's really helpful. And if any of that's in writing, I think it would be helpful to, to receive that so we could ponder mm -hmm. it um, a little more slowly. Um, one question I had was, I'd heard about the changing forecast from Leeds School, and, and obviously it's hard to know when to actually lock in on this version of the crystal ball. But I'm curious, what's the plan either from the, the internal task force or any signal from the board on what what are they going to hitch their wagon to in terms of um, projections for 2021? Are we likely to see adjustments? in what you're suggesting if Leeds is more favorable at the end of September or have you all decided to to plan for a worst case scenario or how are you determining that piece of it? Well, well, that will obviously be a board decision, but what's transpired up to this point in time is we have received three forecasts. The first was very dire, the second was optimistic, and the third retrenched a little bit, not quite as optimistic as the second, and the board gave us guidance to use the third, which also happened to be the most recent forecast. So that is what we're working off of today. We are monitoring. We've got June and July. They've been stronger. We expect to get a, uh, and that is what we are using for what we call the midterm financial plan. But we are anticipating another leads forecast to come in at the end of the month, which would be, um, again, depending on board guidance, perhaps appropriate to use as we translate the midterm financial plan into the 2021 recommended budget. So I would expect that we may uh, use the next forecast as the basis for the 2021 budget process. Okay, thanks. 
I see Rutt Bridges. Yes, Bruce, thanks for being here with us and sharing all this information. Uh, drinking from a fire hose, I'm afraid. Uh, but you mentioned Fairbox ratio, Fairbox uh, uh, revenues of 130 that were originally projected. As a result of COVID, do you have new Fairbox projections and what are, do you have actual numbers through August, for example, of what those are compared to what they were uh, in in the previous year, what do you project them for 2021 at? Um, 2021 is being projected at roughly the 50 to 60 percent level of last year. The answer to the earlier part of your question, yes, we do have actuals, but I do not have them in front of me at the moment. I can certainly supply those along with my written comments uh, to Matthew Heliphant and, and the Dr. Cog staff. And I appreciate. Uh, I apologize for the fire hose. I was asked to try to get this in six minutes. I, I understand. It, it, it's a hard thing to do. Uh, I, the other question I had, uh, Bruce, was on the fact that we're using leads as, as kind of our exclusive uh, sales tax projections. Are there other sources that, uh, for a second opinion on what those might be, that are pretty commonly used? I'm not disrespecting leads in any way, but it's always good to have second opinions if you're facing major surgery. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so back during the fast tracks and the subsequent slowdown when the initial fast tracks projections um, were the subject of lots of community discussion, RTD went out for bid, uh, requested proposals from potential forecasting entities. A number of proposals were received and leads was selected. And I believe they're coming up on uh, that, that RTD is coming up on a, uh, I'll call it a rebid. Um, so I would anticipate that we will once again be going out and soliciting for the services of a projection firm. And obviously, Leeds and others will most likely respond. But right now, Leeds is our, our source of information. Have you considered uh, having more than one source of information for those sales tax projections since they are so critical to? you know, the loss of a lot of jobs and, and the loss of uh, uh, potentially more. Uh, you know, the, it's hard to say how we're gonna do on COVID in 2021. The, the other big projection is trying to understand when we can sort of begin to regain ridership from some, some of the people who have made the decision not to continue to use RTD. I will certainly pass that idea along. I know a couple of our board members have heard it firsthand. Um, <laughs> I will pass that along to our CFO and others for a second, uh, a second opinion. Great. Um, Mayor Millay. So uh, I feel your pain. The city of Lone Tree is in very similar positions regarding sales and use tax, and we rely on it uh, solely as our <laughs> revenue source. We don't, we, we don't really have a fair box option. Um, so uh, we are taking a very conservative uh, viewpoint for next year and looking at, um, there, we're expecting to be 30% down this year and basically that same budget for next year. Uh, and I think we've identified a lot of the unknowns, consumer confidence obviously being one of them. And uh, we are very concerned in Lone Tree about what's gonna happen when people aren't able to be outside shopping and dining and everything is indoors if we're gonna see a drop off. So. I guess part of my question is, I don't really care what Leeds says sometimes. I know you have to care and we certainly look at that, but I guess, are you anticipating, what, what's the percent down that you are projecting for next year? And with the cuts that you've identified, are you going to balance the budget, that $17 million shortfall? It, it, have you identified enough to make up that $17 million? Um, well, the task force has been focused on the 2021 as opposed to the 2020, and the series of recommendations that um, uh, I ran through rapidly earlier yeah. would bring us to a balanced budget based on current forecasts. Now, again, the forecasts are going to change. Things like Fairbox revenues are not coming back to the extent that we had hoped or thought, so that reduction will uh, the shortfall will be deepened as a result of fare box losses. Hopefully it will be offset by some improvements in uh, in sales tax. Um, again, I don't, I, I'm working in, in changes, can certainly provide 
um, the actual forecast number. Well, in, in 20, before COVID, Leeds had projected $711 million for next year. The most recent is that we will get $570 million next year, down $140 million and about 20%. And the 40% decline in, in the fare bucks. So as you budget for 2021, I guess that's my, you know, I, I understand the challenge with the sales tax revenues, but what are you budgeting for in 2021? What What is your, are you, are you assuming the same COVID numbers for next year as you, in your total revenue reduction? Like you're down. We are, we are anticipating um, the sales tax reduction that I just mentioned, which is approximately 140 million, and we are projecting that Fairbox revenues will be down 40 to 50 percent from prior levels. Prior levels being uh, just under 140 million, so we're looking down in the the 70-ish category. And I can certainly get our CFO to to uh, provide the exact numbers that we're using because they are in flux. And then the other question is the union contract, right? The so when your your revenues, but you also your your expenditures. So are you looking at staff? You're looking at twenty to twenty five percent staff reduction too. Is that did I hear that correctly in that list? Yes, we are looking at staffing reductions on both the salaried staff, and there would be layoffs commensurate with the reductions in level of service. Uh, for folks that are directly involved in the provision of service. Those would all be guided by the CBA, uh, the collective bargaining agreement. Our collective bargaining agreement is due for renegotiation. Uh, it expires February 28th of 2021. It is due for renegotiation, uh, and that process would be um, forthcoming. Thank you. Julie Mullica. You're on mute, Julie. You're on. Thank you. Um, I, along with those others, would appreciate your uh, your summary in, in a written form. There's a lot of information there that I'm still trying to, to go through. Um, but one of the questions I did have, um, maybe you could speak to now, um, are I'm curious about which routes um, are still performing well. Um, so flex, flex rides, are people still riding those? Um, I mean, this could be really informa informational about what what is doing well and, and how is that going to impact decisions moving forward? Um, I, I do not have Jesse Carter, the guru of service development, with me at the moment. Right. But what I can share is that the service development group has been monitoring ridership and they have been providing reports on which routes have retained service and which routes have not. In terms of classes of service, light rail is down about 75%. Regional routes are down about um, 75% because they're very commuter centric mm -hmm. and there really is not much of a commuting workforce. Um, whereas the local routes are, which tend to have a uh, ridership that consists of folks that rely on transit, uh, folks who have essential jobs, those are down um, to about 45% of their prior levels. And so I would anticipate that when we bring the January service changes forward, that we will um, be looking for a redeployment of hours from underperforming services to routes like um, I know we've had to beef up service on the, the 15L and the 16L, which are East Colfax and West Colfax. Um, mm -hmm. So I would anticipate that that gets codified in the January run board, or at least recommended. I know that the routes 31, um, the routes on federal, we have had to back up service. Um, so we will need to recommend service improvements on federal. Again, a lot of the routes that, that we need to beef up, we have had to provide additional service during COVID beyond that which is scheduled. We've been able to do that because we've kept everyone on, on staff using the CARES Act money. But when that money goes away, we're going to have to be much more judicious on how we deploy our services. And we're looking to focus those, uh, the recommendations would be to focus and prioritize mobility for folks who depend on transit, who have the essential jobs and have continued to ride. So the 15L, 16L, 31, probably the zero, these are routes that come to mind as 
having retained ridership, whereas, um, uh, I don't know if Peggy Catlin's on the call, uh, I don't mean to pick on her, uh, her district, but the EV and the CV, for example, from Conifer and Evergreen uh, have continued to operate during the pandemic and we're providing uh, service that's carrying four and five people in from Evergreen and Conifer. And we're working with Dr. Cog's staff to try, uh, we co-sponsored the van pool program with them to put van pools out in Conifer and Evergreen so we can redeploy those hours into uh, local routes where ridership's been sustained. All right, thank you. Uh, yes, Daya. Yeah, thank you for the presentation um, and the information. My question is around workforce. So prior to COVID, you, I know RTD was already facing a driver shortage. Um, I think the last thing that we want right now, especially in a pandemic, is for us to continually, um, you know, have this 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 fear of recruiting folks and trying to get folks onto, you know, into these positions. So I'm just kind of curious if there's been any conversations either at the staff or the board level about how we might be able to, you know, once we come out of the darkness, um, recruit operators and what the impact is going to be on operators um, into the future. Has there been any conversation about that? Um, there, there has been continuing conversation about that. Um, you're right on mark when you say pre-COVID, we had, the organization had its challenges, both re hiring, recruiting, retaining operators. Um, at the moment, complements of the CARES Act, we have in excess of 300 operators that we have been able to retain but have no bid assignment. And we are uh, deploying those to provide the follower type services that I alluded to. Um, but I think that's, that's what I mean when I talk about we need to be flexible as we come out of this because the last thing we wanna do is cut back workforce so much that as we come out of the pandemic, we're ill-prepared. So we're cognizant of that. Um, just in the last week, I mentioned our numbers have changed regarding the, the anticipated layoffs because we put another 40, 45 folks back on what I would call the retain list because we don't want to cut so deeply that, that we don't keep a good foundation upon which to build back. So very cognizant of it. Great question. Thank you. Dan Blankenship. Hi, Bruce. How are hey, you? Man. Pretty good. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. Um, thanks for the overview. I, I have a question. The, the, the shortfall projected for 2021 is 166 million approximately. And is, uh, uh, is part of that gap or 114 million of that gap being bridged by deferred capital and maintenance and the balance is coming from uh, cuts within the organization and use of reserves? And is there a rough percentage of how that overall shortfall is being funded from each one of those uh, strategies? Well, the, the $114 million of uh, deferred asset management projects or AMP projects, um, those projects were moved out before the 166 million number was calculated. So what we're hoping to do is be flexible enough to bring the higher priority of those projects back in. What we have done is our midterm financial plan is a six year sort of strategic look at the budget. And so last year, 2021 had asset management plan replacements and acquisitions. They have been moved out of 2021 and distributed between 22 through 26 um, to keep them within the six year planning horizon. But 2021 moved that 114 million out before the 166 uh, shortfall was calculated. Does that make sense or did I go in a circle? No, I think I think that makes sense. Um, you have a hundred and sixty six million dollar shortfall. And so uh, what what percentages are coming from cuts and use of reserve? And then are you looking at additional deferred capital and maintenance to, to uh, balance the budget next year? Um, well, that that one fourteen reflects the deferred capital and um, 
capital and asset management, approximately, making me dig through papers here, Dan. Um, no, that's okay. You, you can you can provide this information later for a second. Okay. <laughs> Make you use your calculator, but uh, be glad to do that. about how the, how that is it all coming from just cuts that you mentioned for use of reserve? How that's going to be bridged in in rough percentages? Um, yes, I'll be glad to do that. I just don't happen to have that PowerPoint in front of me. That is part of what's being presented tomorrow evening. Uh, how much is coming from reserves, how much is coming from um, future contributions to the FISA, how much uh, is coming from, oh, wait a moment here, Paul Ballard is thumbing through tomorrow's PowerPoint. So, <laughs> so the 100, um, 166, we are looking for, so administrative savings, we look at our organization in terms of the base system and fast tracks. We've got the firewall, six tenths of the system funds, six tenths of a percent funds the base system, four tenths is funded by the fast tracks initiative from 2004. So in the, um, in the base system, approximately 100 and, uh, excuse me, 18 million is coming from personnel reductions. Other administrative reductions, things like the reduced ADA, uh, and fic are coming uh, about six million service reductions, which are moving from the 100% to the 60% level, which is what we did in April, as well as the lessened demand for ADA services, uh, the lessened demand for flex ride services, that comes up with about another 88 million. And again, these are base systems. Um, we would be looking at using some small portion of the future FISA contribution because the main FISA contribution goes to help balancing fast tracks. But in fast tracks, approximately four and a half million dollars coming from administrative um, changes, um, 56 million coming from reserves. 17 million coming from future contributions uh, that would be made to support the Fast Tracks program instead of going into the savings account, uh, and about three and a half million dollars coming from service. So between those two, all those numbers would add up to about 166 million dollars. And yes, I'll be glad to provide that along with my comments to Matthew for distribution. Thanks, Bruce. Yes. Elise Jones. You're muted. Elise, you're on mute. Thank you. Seems like a recurring theme in all of this is um, sort of fluidity and uh, ever ch shifting numbers. And given that, I'm s sort of surprised or I'd, I'd be concerned about talking about a six year financial plan. We don't know what's going to happen in three months, let alone six years. So, and also the January run board, um, it seems like we're still in pandemic service mode rather than anything that's, that's stable or long-term. It seems like, well, if I were an RTD board member, and we do have two on this call, um, that I would be suggesting that anything that the board adopts would be short-term in duration with a, a sunset provision to revisit on a pretty quick turnaround given how fluid these things are because the crystal ball is awfully murky to lock in anything long term and I'm just curious what your reaction is to that. Uh, I think you're right on mark in terms of the fluidity and the murkiness of the crystal ball. Um, I know one of the conversations that has taken place at board study sessions is the possibility of looking at a two-year midterm financial plan as opposed to a six-year midterm financial plan. Um, but we continue to try to understand how one year could potentially impact the next. Um, but we do need to be very, very flexible, as I mentioned in the comments. From a service perspective, we routinely revisit our service um, three times a year. From a budget perspective, it's been practice to um, adopt and then amend once. There is nothing that pre would preclude that from um, 
happening more often than just once, but there has been uh, active conversation amongst the board at study sessions about the midterm financial plan being a two-year plan instead of a six-year plan that would address 21 and 22. The 21 element becomes the basis for forming the 21 budget. So I think you're right on mark. Thanks. All right. Lynn Geisinger. I'll just add a couple things. Um, uh, these are great questions and thanks, Bruce. That was great. Um, I'll check into the $17 million deficit at the end of 2020. I'm, I don't know that, I thought we were getting carried through with the CARES Act, unless you have, have something to add to that, Bruce. Um, I'm not sure what that, where that number is. And um, I would just, to what Elise addressed, um, we are looking, uh, some of us are pushing for a two-year midterm financial plan and also to make the, rather than the January run board, which becomes then the new plan, to continue this as pandemic plan two that would have an end date. Um, the one that's been suggested is next September um, so that these changes are still a, a short-term uh, change. Um, I think everything else Bruce has covered well. Um, thank you, Director Geisinger. I will look into the 2020 ending balance. It was my understanding that we may, if, but that with the amended budget, it was targeted to balance it. But I do know that not all savings that were proposed were generated. I will look into the projected 2020 end balance, hopefully stronger sales tax through the remainder of the year, as we saw in June and July, will help us bring in uh, 2020 either balanced or with a slight surplus to carry forward, complements the CARES Act. I will check with the CFO on that. Rut Bridges? Bruce, I'd just like to second uh, what Elise said about the, the duration of planning a two year. The idea of a six year plan in this environment right now appears to me to be uh, a, a difficult challenge. And, you know, six year plans are great, but I don't, I don't think that there's enough visibility out six years to really know what RTD may be facing. So, uh, I, I, I really hope that'll be given serious consideration by the board. I'm sure it sounds like it already is. <laughs> Active conversation and I see two head nods from board members on this call. And I am, I am certain that there are others doing likewise, but not on screen. <laughs> are there any other questions? Yes, Daya. Yes, yeah, so I just want to circle back around with Rutt's earlier comment on seeking a, a second opinion on the sales tax. I, I do think, especially for the board going into 2021 and the level of uncertainty that we have right now, I, I think it's worth at least considering. And whether that's something that we as an accountability group or um, even the board take on, I think we need that second opinion, especially as we go into our own work. Okay, great. Thank you. I will pass that along. Hi, this is Kathy. Um, I did have one question, and that is, um, what work is being done with your union, the representative staff? Um, it seems like a lot of layoffs is going to obviously come from the represented uh, workforce. What work has been done in that space already, if any? Um, we have had conversations with them, apprised them of some of the potential numbers. Um, there were initial conversations about whether or not furloughs might be an appropriate approach, um, but that is not something that is included in the collective bargaining agreement at the current time. Are there any other questions? I see Jackie Malay. No, I just said there's a lot of questions, but, <laughs> but I think you've done a great job. Yeah. So thank you. Yes. Okay. Well, um, yeah, it doesn't look doesn't appear to be any other questions. Uh, thank you so much, Bruce, for your presentation. 
Um, and I'm assuming we can connect with you and you'll, we'll be hearing from you soon on um, a follow-up to, to some of the requests made today. Great, I will provide my comments in writing to Matthew for distribution. I uh, will attempt to get some questions to our answers to the other questions. Um, and we remain available to answer whatever questions you may have for us. All righty, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you. All righty. Okay. Um, Okay, that concludes our informational briefings. We do have a few administrative items to take care of. Um, the first one being our future meeting schedule. Um, we had agreed to a bi-weekly schedule pre-subcommittee formation, and um, there's been conversation around perhaps uh, relaxing that to, uh, I believe it was once a month, um, unless there are other um, recommendations. Uh, so I just wanted to open up the floor for conversation, um, I believe that was the last recommendation made by, um, I don't know if it was staff, but it was certainly part of our conversation in our prior meeting. Madam Co-Chair. Yes. Doug Rex here. Um, yes, you're exactly correct. Um, Lord knows you guys have been very receptive and respond and, uh, and flexible in uh, scheduling all these meetings. I mean, we've had quite a few thus far. Um, we thought, Simply because you know the, the the now that the subcommittees have been formed, that the you know the majority of the you know the I'll say the actual work, but you know what I mean. I mean the study sessions associated with that. There will be quite a bit of work. Um, so we thought about maybe just holding one full committee every month, put it on a, a monthly schedule. I would suggest the uh, the second when uh, second Monday of the month, which just is today. And uh, we will work with the subcommittees then to schedule additional meetings. We would like to get a standing committee, or sorry, standing times for those committees. So we'll be sending out a doodle poll here real quick, but I would suggest um, maybe that could, those subcommittees meeting a couple times a month. And of course, they're willing to meet more, more or less often um, depending on the amount of work they have. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Does anyone I think have makes a whole lot of sense? Yeah. So, so the subcommittees can really dive in and go deep and spend some time. Sorry to interrupt. Nope, I was going to ask for comments and you gave them. <laughs> All righty. Um, <laughs> thanks, Rob, for your thumbs up, and Chris. It looks like, um, well, I'll just officially ask for a, a yay or nay. Uh, well, I guess anyone opposed to, that might be easier, anyone opposed to a monthly meeting for the larger um, committee meetings? I am not seeing any thumbs down <laughs> or any any um, head shaking um, to indicate that. So it sounds like we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and move forward with that. Um, and uh, Dr. Cog's staff will send out a due to poll um, to schedule the best time. I, I was just looking at the calendar. If it's the second Monday in October, that's uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. So we just might need to amend that one. Um, and I'm sure there'll be other, there may be other conflicts, but just for the next meeting. Um, okay, wonderful. Are there any other member comments or other matters um, that we should be discussing? I do see um, the accountability committee webpage um, as an item listed. Staff, do you want to comment on that? Yes, I'm just going to take you, uh, uh, show you, I'm going to um, share my screen and show the committee uh, our, uh, the, the Dr. Cog website as well as the RTD website. I had previously uh, I've, on Friday afternoon um, sent a link to the RTD website, which will be very useful uh, for the committee and the subcommittees as uh, that's where uh, the documents will be shared. So I'll, I will just share my screen and show you really quick. So this is the doctor. Uh, does, can everyone see the screen? Yes. Good. Um, so this is the Dr. Cog webpage. Uh, it, 
As you can see, this is um, drcog.org slash RTD dash accountability dash committee. It's still a work in progress, uh, but uh, we, we have a web page up with a blurb about the committee and we will, um, we will have uh, some, um, we, we have links to uh, the, the meetings, uh, both the accountability committee meetings, and then we will include links uh, for information uh, about the um, subcommittee meetings. Uh, also, there is a link to the RTD accountability committee um, website uh, that um, RTD hosts which I had previously sent out a, um, a link through email. Um, it's taken a second to load, but uh, this, this page, in, in, as I said, includes the, um, the, the uh, committee request library. So if you click on this link right here, You will see what we've um, already requested RTD on the committee's behalf to get us started. Uh, there's a full archive, there's an overview, then there's documents that are specific to the subcommittees. There's a search, but here is the list. So as you can see, there's a fiscal sustainability update, the 2020 amended budget, uh, and you can read the rest of these. So there's several different documents that are already uploaded on the site. And Dr. Cog's staff will continue to work on the, um, the, the web page for the committee on, um, uh, on the Dr. Cog site. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, Kristen. Will the Dr. Cog with link to the accountability committee include things like um, the agenda and the su meeting summaries and also any kind of working documents. Yes. Uh, the, the committee already, the, the, the page already includes link to the um, the committee documents, the meeting documents, uh, but those okay. are also located on uh, the the main web page on the calendar as well. And we can also include uh, some of the key documents from from the committee on that page as well. Super, that would be great. Thank you. All right, it doesn't look like there are any other questions. Thank you so much for that. Any update. other questions? Uh, it doesn't, oh, was that a question from you, Troy? Okay, just movement, it's important. Okay, yeah, it, it doesn't appear that there are any other questions. So I just wanna thank you for um, sharing that. That does look like it's gonna be a really helpful resource. So um, thank you for, for that update. I, I just say I spent quite a bit of time on that in the last few days, and there is a ton of great information out there. Not everything we will need, I'm sure, but a, a lot of background, and, and it's very useful, very really well done. Yeah, yes, thank you. I did see that the request started in May, so thank you for being so um, perceptive of our needs and <laughs> making some of those requests really early on before we even formed as a committee. And if uh, the, the requests, uh, if the committee has requests for additional documents, uh, they, they can go through me and I and there's a portal that went, uh, RTD staff set up for me to make those requests. Okay. Wonderful. Again, thank you for that update. Um, we are, are there any other matters that um, we should discuss as a committee? We have a couple of minutes left. Yes, Elise, you're on mute. Did it again. Um, I had a question about um, while the committee's focus tends to 
is more focused on the long-term sustainability of RTD. The discussion this morning with Bruce Abel brought up whether or not the committee should be weighing in on, um, on some of the short-term things that are happening to RDD that might have a, a long-term impact on the work that we're doing. Um, and I guess I just want to raise that up. We gave some feedback directly to Bruce about suggesting that um, adopting a shorter term financial plan rather than a six year would make more sense. Um, also made comments about whether or not we should be do, adopting a traditional January run board, which then tends to put in place future run boards as opposed to recognizing that we're still in pandemic mode. And again, short term, encouraging RTD to make short term decisions during the pandemic rather than anything that would, would provide a foundation for long term. Is that something that the committee wants to voice in a more formal fashion? Do we feel like we've articulated that by virtue of comments to Bruce Abel and in the presence of our two RTD board members? Um, I, I just wanted to throw that out to the committee in terms of what what role, if any, we should be playing in this space. And I'm happy to hear from our RTD board members if they have thoughts on what would be useful for the board as a whole. Yes, Kristen. Oh, go ahead. I, which one first? I Kristen, think. Go ahead. Uh, I think because of how this committee was developed, I think we need to be a little bit more formal in our request to be a part of the decisions that RTD is making right now, because it will affect how we respond as as a whole. Lynn, sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. <laughs> That's okay. I was going to see if Troy wanted to add anything and then I could, no. I, um, both of those topics are, um, it's only been kind of straw poll in early discussion, but I think they have good support from the board. Um, I don't know if a, a formal statement um, would help, uh, or we certainly can take this back with the accountability committee you know, has expressed support as well. Um, Troy, any thoughts there? No? Okay. Um, hey guys, it's Chris. It, you know, I, I actually would not recommend a move like that. I, we've had, you know, essentially two and a half meetings and I, I think we have, you know, a, a, a sort of relatively well-defined mission and, and I don't think it's to weigh in and maybe people disagree and maybe I don't understand it correctly. I'm, on the on the day-to-day -day workings at the, at the board level like it's, it's good to give them advice but I I, mean, I I I certainly don't know enough about how the process works etc um in the what's worth and it's also somewhat organizing for us I, I don't think our intention sorry Jackie is to sorry Mayor is to, is to be um you know a, a, a backup board if you will Chris I'm, I'm agreeing with you 100 percent i'm i'm very much in a, an agreement we we all have uh the rtd board gets to hear from the mayors a lot so i i don't need another uh forum to do that so and it's jackie don't not mayor and this I is kathy saying, nesbitt um i think we have a well-defined um charge and um i don't believe that that was included in it so i would be apprehensive without going back to the governor um, to weigh in on anything other than what he's asked us to. I wasn't saying that we were going to chime in. I was mostly saying we need that for informational purposes. I, I'm fine with us not doing anything now, and I think we've we've given mm -hmm. some fodder for Troy and Lynn to weigh in, but I guess I would disagree that if RTD is making long-term decisions now that uh, uh, foreclose options that this committee and the new general manager and other folks have to assure future sustainability that we do have a right and that it is under our purview say hey we encourage you not to make long-term decisions that um that would uh, undermine or limit our ability to holistically look at the long-term future so I agree we don't want to meddle, micromanage in the day-to-day -day operations, but if they start implicating long-term, multi-year decisions, 
um, then I would say we have a right to say, hey, um, we encourage you not to go to, go there yet before we have a chance to weigh in. Otherwise, we're we're be making our we're marginalizing marginalizing ourselves before we even get going. So, but it sounds like it, it, most people are comfortable letting what was said today carry the day and not doing anything further, and that's that's fine. Um, but I would probably be likely to bring this issue up in the future if something uh, similar comes up. So. Thanks, Elise. Um, I tend to agree with um, that perspective, um, but again, I'm trying to defer to the, the the comfortability of the of the group. But again, it's I think it's not off the table, at least in my personal opinion, not co-chair role. Um, that, that that's okay to, to kind of make a comment on. But Lynn, Troy, are you guys clear on on some of the comments that we made? Are you guys are good on on that to share? Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, I, have a, I have a question though. It it yes. seems like we learned today more just as a side comment what was coming before the board, which were these, you know, the the run board and the six year financial plan. To Elisa's point, which I think is a good one, how could we learn from RTD when those substantial long-term decisions are coming forward so that we have an opportunity to determine whether they, they matter or not to where we're headed as a committee? That's a great question. I believe that our RTD update will be a standing update for okay. um, decisions um, for, that, for that reason. Okay, and they would cover what's coming up on their agenda then as part of the standing update. Um, Dr. Cogs, uh, Doug, anyone um, want to comment on the, the content? Oh, I know we're a little over, so maybe um, if you just quick comment. Yeah, this yeah is, just this real is quick. Ron. Oh, go ahead, Ron. Sorry, Doug. Yeah, this is Ron. I, what we anticipate is, is monitoring the upcoming RTD um, agenda packets and so that we can flag things and, and make the committee aware of those discussions and um, keep the keep the committee informed of those um, items going forward to the RTD board. Perfect. Okay. We are six minutes over, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time and thank you for hanging in there a few more minutes. This was a really great discussion and um, we are adjourned. Thanks, Thanks. I'll see you next month. <laughs>